Welcome to another edition of Wildcat Country. Eric Cohen and Shane Dale on what has been an awesome weekend for Arizona athletics. I mean, you can't get much better than what we had this weekend. You had a huge win over a top six, seven team in, in men's basketball. You had a top 25 win in women's basketball. And you had commitment a palooza in football, Shane. This was just about as good of a weekend. It wasn't what we had 10 years ago where you had the New Mexico Bowl and then you had the the Florida game that yeah you know, we talked about I mean that was awesome. This was pretty good though. I'll, well, I'll admit it's pretty good. Well, we talked was well, just a couple of weeks ago about when Arizona men's basketball won the Maui Invitational and the football beat ASU and we asked was that the best week in 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 as long as we can remember. Well, this one is is pretty close. Pretty close in terms of the commitments uh for for football not to mention the uh, the, the big basketball wins. Uh, shout out to the women's team as well for, for bouncing yeah. back after a bad loss to Kansas and beating a very good Baylor team. Uh, probably the only downside. Uh, well, and I'll, I'll have a couple because you know me, Eric. I'll have some negative things to say, critical things. Let's let's call them critical, critical things to say. As we see in the corporate world, opportunities for the men's basketball team. Uh, but the, I guess the and the only other negative, I guess, is you know we saw some um, you know some errors and players have decommitted who have gone elsewhere, and a lot of them have gone to one school, which we'll get into. Um, but overall, great weekend anyway. Uh, and you know, as far as like you know, what's happened in a two to three day span, it's been outstanding. So we had this great promotion uh, from Ice Shaker. We're giving away a couple of ice shakers before Christmas. We're going to announce our winners at the beginning of the third segment. Right. Coming up in the next segment, we have Aaron Torres, who's our resident college basketball expert. You can find him uh, on Twitter. He's everywhere. He has Torres uh, at Torres on Arizona is his uh, Wildcats page. So we're going to talk to him. Always a great guest. Then we're going to talk about uh, the Ice Shaker winners and everything that happened with Arizona football uh, this weekend, because there's a lot and a lot to get to. But let's start off with Buy or Sell, which is presented by our friends at Ice Shaker. You can go get one of these beauties uh, online. Uh, uh, Shane's drinking one if you're watching, and I'm trying to show one if not for my background. You can, uh, Just keep it in front I- of you. Keep it in front of there, you. There you go. IceShaker.com and get one of those, or you can go to fanatics.com and pick up uh, one of the ice shakers that we're giving away today. Uh, if you go to iceshaker.com, use promo code Wildcat Country, capital W, capital C. They are great late uh, Christmas or Hanukkah gifts or whatever you celebrate. Uh, these are a great present for somebody who is a Wildcat fan. All right, Shane, uh, number one, uh, let's get right to it. Last year's officiating debacle against Tennessee, which we discussed last week, was reversed on Saturday night. The balls kind of got hosed uh, in that Arizona shot 27 free throws to Tennessee's 10. Buy or sell? Well, I have some critical things to say, but that's not one of them. I, I think the only play that really stands out to me, because it looked, Arizona was the more physical team, which I thought was fantastic against Tennessee, which is known for that. They earned their trips to the line. So it's it's lazy just to say, well, they got we got called for twice as many fouls. How is that fair? Well, maybe you committed twice as many fouls. There was one sequence late in the game where it looked like I think everyone in the arena, just watching on TV, thought there was going to be a foul call. There was a collision, a couple of collisions in Arizona. It was a mad scramble. Arizona got the ball back. Like everyone at McHale was like, oh, okay, because we thought that Tennessee was going to have a chance to make it a two point game. You look back at it, and I don't necessarily think it was an obvious call there. So, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I think Arizona did, they understood the assignment. Let, let me go over, let me use this opportunity to, to present my wet blanket list. Okay. We'll go over that real quick. Mm-hmm. So for Tennessee, Josiah Jordan James didn't play, uh, okay. and he's one of their one of their better um, rebounders and defenders. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Arizona's beaten several good teams this year that haven't been 100 percent when they played them, including the last two games against top 25 teams. So okay. I'm just throwing that out there as a caveat. Mm-hmm. Some dumb mistakes. I know we're going to talk more about Kirk Carissa, but mm-hmm. we'll get to that. Uh, Pella Larson stepping in bounds late mm-hmm. could have been yep. could have been a bad. It could result in a very bad situation for Arizona. And I'm still concerned about Arizona's closeout defense on three point shots. Uh, Tennessee's threes were falling early. Then they got cold. I don't think, I think that had less to do with Arizona's defense and more to do with Tennessee's streaky shooting. Uh, but the good, Pell Larson developing into the star that we, we thought he, he could be. He's getting there. He made, fi- he scored five very important points late in the game. And he did it by taking the ball to the hoop, getting fouled. Didn't depend on the three-point shot. In fact, against Indiana and Tennessee, he was combined 0 for 7 from three-point range. But he still had some very good games because he 
He took it to the hoop. He got to the line. He's 15 of 15 from the line in those two games. Mm -hmm. uh, so when he's his three start falling, look out. So the Pella Larson we've seen the last couple of weeks has been great. Uh, Arizona did only shot five of 24 from three point range, and they still won against a very good team. That's a good sign. And Umar mm -hmm. Balo, speaking of free throws, everyone's favorite topic, went six of seven from the line. Mm -hmm. He's been a 50% free, uh, free throw shooter this year. He was 70%, just over 70 last year. So if he can get back there, I think it's a very good sign. But if you're going to complain about the officiating today, if you're a Tennessee fan, uh, look, we all see things through through different lenses. I, I think that you could you could find some very – obvious situations that Arizona got some, some call, some stupid calls against them in Knoxville last year, this game in Tucson, I think you'd be hard pressed to find situations where, where Arizona got favorable calls and they were just a more physical team. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm going to sell this one as well. I, I, last year's game against Tennessee was just bad. I mean, it was, it was really bad. The, the officiating at the end of the game was bad. I, I thought this one on Saturday, I think you're right. Arizona just went inside more often than Tennessee did and they drew fouls. I, there were some ticky tack ones, but I, I'm not going to say, you know, maybe Tennessee didn't get the calls that they probably wanted, but I, I don't, I don't think they got hosed. How about that? Is that, a, is that a, oh, yeah, way to do it? so I'm going to, I'm going to sell that one. Okay. Number two. We talked to Casey Jacobson about this last week, but we're going to talk about it right now and by yourself. The Kerr dilemma, as Casey pointed out last week, when he starts off cold, he pretty much stays cold. So by yourself, Shane, Kerr needs to stop shooting if he starts off ice cold as he did on Saturday night. So you like to buy and sell sometimes, so I'm going to do that mm -hmm. too. Okay. Uh, right. I, I am hard-pressed to think of someone – in Arizona athletics history, who's more of an asset and a liability at the same time as Kirk Risa. Okay. Uh, he's a fantastic passer. He's better this year. He's one of the best passers in the game. Uh, and and he, he can shoot. He can make some big shots as well. Obviously, he's fearless. With that said, um, just backtracking, that, that technical that Arizona got when he decided to walk off the bench after Courtney Ramey hit that big three, Mikhail was going crazy. They go up 10. It looks like they're going to run away with it. Then everything comes to a screeching halt. Mm -hmm. And I saw that Arizona's bench got a technical. And I was thinking what everyone else was. I bet it was Kirk Reese. Somehow, some way it was Kirk Reese. And, and, and it sure was. And that was a killer, Shane. That was a killer. It, it almost it, it almost cost Arizona the game. Literally, yes. almost cost Arizona. So that was big. And then going back to the shooting, yeah, Casey talked about it. Casey Jacobson in, in Arizona's losses last year, they, he was like 15% from the field or from three-point range. And he did the same thing against Tennessee. He keeps trying to shoot his way out of it. He doesn't have to do that. He's a passer first. Pass the ball. He made a great pass to Balo late in the game uh, that put Arizona up, I think, uh, like five or six points. Great interior pass when Balo was like positioning himself inside. It was it was beautiful. It was classic Kirk Creasa in terms of the good Kirk Creasa. So he doesn't have to shoot. You know, I keep thinking back, Eric, to um, I want to say it was the Pac-12 championship game last year against UCLA. Remember, he took like three or four straight three pointers in the same possession. They kept giving him the ball. He kept shooting it. Or whatever. It's like, just stop it, dude. You don't have to do that. Yeah. So I admire the confidence. The reason I was going to sell it too, though, Eric, is because Kirk Creasa is who Kirk Creasa is. If you ask him to do all the good things while taking away the other stuff, I, I feel like it's just, it's like asking him to, to like sever a limb. It's just, you can't do it. It's just who he is, unfortunately. So I'll buy it. I would like to see him stop shooting as much. But I'm selling in terms of, I think that's just his personality and he's not going to change. All right. I'm buying this one. Yeah. Curry, you get four shots, to start the game. You don't make any of them start passing. He <laughs> went to the rim. He got his first points going to the rim uh, on Saturday. That was fine. He hit one three, but you know what? Unless you have an open shot and it's a night where it doesn't look like it's good for you. Stop shooting. That's all I'm saying. Don't yeah. take a contested shot. If you're over four and you're not having a night, I'm with you hundred percent. I'm just saying it's just not, it's not, it's not who he is. He's not going to, he's not going to stop talking trash. He's not going to stop sticking his tongue out to opposing fans. And he's not going to, going to stop shooting like that. So you get what you get with him is what I'm saying. Did you have any problem uh, with the end of the game? Uh, there was a little, uh, yeah, what was I, going on there? I did. I did. I, I kind of, I mean, look, I don't mind the swagger of Arizona, but I, I mean, it's not so much that I want to see them win with class. I, I it's more that I just wanted to knock that off because it's not necessary. Uh, yeah. The shoving back and forth, and Marbala with a double bird. I just, I, I don't. You don't. You can. You can have some swag and not do that stuff. You know, it, it reminded me a little bit of when Arizona was very fortunate to get past TCU in the second round last season, and they're like, you know, waving goodbye to the TCU fans and all that, and showing. Like, I don't mind the sportsmanship aspect of it, but it's like. 
sometimes you got to be counting your your lucky stars that you 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 survived a game. And I felt like that, yeah. even though Arizona beat a very good Tennessee team, mm-hmm. they made some big mistakes down the stretch that could have cost them the game. And they were, I don't want to say fortunate because they earned the win, but I would have liked to just see them get off the court. I know they have bad blood with them and that makes for exciting rivalry, but just exit the court and, and show what all you want in the locker room. I, I'm kind of tired of that act. All right. Uh, number three, Shane, buy or sell. Uh, assuming Arizona, now we're recording this Monday night. Arizona has two games this week, uh, Montana State, Morgan State. I assume that they're going to win both with relative ease. But uh, if that if that happens, Shane, assuming Arizona wins both of these games with, with relatives, relative ease, buy yeah. or sell. This was as good of a pre-Pac-12 season as one could have reasonably expected. And I'm going to count Utah, the Utah and Cal games as part of this. I know those are technically Pac-12 games, but one loss, considering the schedule, is about as good as anybody could have expected, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'll buy it. I mean, you would if you looked at their record, you wouldn't think that the one loss would have been at Utah, but no, but it was, and and that's okay. It was a clunker coming off the Maui game, and that was their only true road game of the season, which does concern me a little bit. And we'll talk about this more next week, going into their game against ASU, which is now has now entered the top 25. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they've only played uh, home and neutral site games. They played a lot of neutral games and the Indiana game was, there were more Indiana fans there. I actually yeah. talked to, I work with a guy who uh, was, is a big, is an IU alum and was at the the game in oh. Vegas. And, and he said it was, yeah, the Arizona fans were great, but it was like two to one Indiana fans. So yeah, that's what I heard from a, a U of a friend who was there. And he told yeah. me beforehand, he said, this is going to be like an Indiana home game. I was like, oh, you're, you're full of it. He, he said, yeah. no, you got to trust me. He was right. Very, very few fan bases out, out travel uh, the men's basketball team here in Arizona and Indiana. I mean, they do have a history. So you credit. Get it. Yeah. But it, so yes, absolutely a great non-conference. I think, it, I mean, obviously they could have been undefeated. That would have been better, but realistically, yes. One loss with some of the wins they have already uh, is, is, is massive, especially in terms of uh, seeding come March. Uh, I, I am concerned going into the Pac-12 uh, schedule that they haven't played a lot of true road games. You know, when they play ASU, there's going to be a lot of U of A fans there, but it's still going to be a road game. Mm-hmm. It's a little different. So, uh, But if you're talking about the, the non-conference schedule and you're including Utah and Cal in there, yeah, it's, I guess it's not an A-plus because they didn't win every game, but definitely a solid A. Well, I mean, you just have to look at it this way, Shane. When they started the season, they were, what, number 17, I believe, and we're like, well, that might be a little high. Whatever. They're number yeah. five right now. Yep, and yep. Probably going into the Arizona State game on New Year's Eve day, uh, they're going to be in the top five. I mean, assuming that they win these two, yeah, that, I so. mean, that's that's a plus to me. So easy buy without going long, without getting long winded. Yeah, I'll keep this one short for you guys. I've been uh, I've been the long winded one today. Uh, number four, Shane, and this is one of your favorite topics. Uh, more damage was done via the media than the actual IARP ruling last week. Yeah. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Uh, and I don't know how permanent it was. And in terms of um, reloading, I, you know, Sean Miller still had some success at Arizona after that. There was that the one the one season that came directly after the uh, the book Richardson news. And then, of course, the bogus DeAndre Ayton report was mm-hmm. rough, you know, and, and Sean Miller had to add some grad transfers and, and depend on those guys. They, they just weren't that good that season. But after that, he did a pretty good job reloading you know, the following year with, with Nico Mannion and Zeke Naji and um, Josh Green. So they were still in pretty good shape. And, and he obviously left Tommy Lloyd with a very good situation. So, uh, but I, yeah, the, the media coverage and, and not, I mean, not just that, but the false reporting and, and some certain people, guys who ahead, just call them out his just names rhyme, rhyme with Vic Dytel mm-hmm. who are just mm-hmm. stubborn about the whole thing and it's like oh, yeah ESPN's got some culpability they've never Mark Schleybaugh's never had to retract anything never had to apologize never been disciplined in any way I never call for guys to get fired I don't think he should have been but there should be something in there that's I know you, you feel free to disagree with me but there should be something there that says look we got this wrong because obviously they did so from a national standpoint, not just the report, but the insistence from national media and even some local media members, you know, especially after the eight report came out that he should have been fired. Sean Miller should have been fired right away was erroneous, but uh, thankful to be moving on. And um, I will talk to Aaron Torres more about that. I'm sure he's going to he's going to gloat a little bit because he's been he's been an Arizona apologist for a long time. And he like Sean Miller, he was vindicated uh, last week. Shane, let me ask you a random question kind of off topic. Uh, since this all went down a few years ago, have you noticed that you've been watching less ESPN than usual? 
<laughs> I have, but m- that's more because because I have a child now. <laughs> okay, but but I mean, in general, when you have a chance to watch, like for me, I find myself like outside of games and maybe college game day. Oh yeah, I, I don't I don't watch that. I don't much ESPN. I don't watch any analysis. I, I watch very little across the board, just because I don't. Hmm. I generally just don't care what other people think that much. Uh, well, some, I don't. Some, I don't read their stuff as much anymore either. I don't, well, I don't. Well, plus there's ESPN Plus. It's like they want ESPN wants people to pay for prediction. And I have that. I have ESPN Plus. Yeah, I don't. I, and then there's some that. very good. There's some very good talent. I mean, Scott yeah. Van Pelt is, stands out as somebody oh, who's, yeah. who's excellent. I just outside of sporting events now, and as I said, game day. Like I just not. And, and I guarantee you, I am not the only one. I because I've heard from other people yeah. that, that they're the same way. And I mean, there are reasons for, you know, you have a, a little son and everything fun, like that. But I'm just saying in general, do you trust ESPN like you once did? And the answer is no. So, yeah, the the answer to the, the buy or sell is, yeah, well, you got to buy. The more damage was done via the media yeah. than the actual IARP. I, I mean, that was absolute garbage. Uh, we thought this was going to be a whole deal. We spent shows talking about nothing happened. Absolute waste of freaking time well the the question is and we'll never get this answer but we'll ask Aaron about it is did arizona do what they needed to do by the, the self-imposed restrictions including yeah. the, the tournament ban was that enough so if they hadn't done that would would the would the irp have 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 done a, a postseason ban you, you never know Who, you never who's know. to say but the bottom line is it's over they still have some restrictions including a um you know a, a seven-week communication ban coming up so tommy lloyd's gonna have to work around that and his assistants as well but yeah, I, I am so thankful this is over and I'm thankful that the, the result was what it was. All right, let's talk a little women's basketball. What a what a pasting is the first word that comes to mind. 75-54 uh, in Texas over Baylor, who is a ranked team. Uh, number five, Shane, it is time to believe once again in Adia Barnes squad after the uh, the pasting that we saw last night in Texas. Yeah, I'll buy 100%. And I, I never really stopped believing, but you know, that was a weird game against Kansas, a home game at McHale where, you know, the support for the women has been off the chart the last couple of years compared to before then um, to get drubbed by that, like that at home to at the time, an unranked team was, was something else. But I, I think this team is kind of learning its identity. Uh, they got a lot of new pieces more so than, than, than in previous years. I think it's funny. Cause I, I feel like they miss Sam Thomas's leadership a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think they're trying to kind of iron out who, who, the, you know, who the new leader is. And, and they have a lot of very good players, but like not someone necessarily who's going to take over the games. So they're kind of figuring that out uh, for those who don't like the transfer portal and being able just to switch schools so often uh, counterpoint would be Jade LaVille who transferred from ASU to U of A. We're going to talk is, about this Shane. I know. And, We're going to talk she, about this later in the show, but she has been Don't outstanding. Okay. I under, I'm not just, okay. just, just, right. just chill X, right. just chill X, but she has been outstanding. Uh, it was a great yes. pickup up for Adia Barnes. She has a great uh, freshman class that's coming around as well. Uh, Shana Pellington and Kate Reese are still there. So it looks like they've righted the ship and, and kind of a, it's, Tommy Lloyd likes to win with offense. Adia wins with defense and, and uh, Arizona's defense against Baylor was outstanding. Uh, so yeah, I, I think they're actually among of all five Pac-12 teams ranked right now on the women's side. They're last of those five. Mm-hmm. By the end of the season, I predict they will not be the last of those five. I still think uh, they're, they're a second or third that. place team in the Pac-12. Yeah, and this is a great win. I mean, after the Kansas game, now I'll be honest, I didn't see any of the game on Sunday night, obviously, with football on and, and whatnot. But this is a fantastic W to get back on track against a, a former national championship team, strong women's basketball program. And what was essentially you know, you a got- road game as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is great. So back on the Adia Bar- Barnes bandwagon, and I'm going to stand by this regardless of anything else that happens this year. Adia Barnes deserves a lifetime contract to the University of Arizona. She does. Great. And I think that should be done right now. She's it's an what, alumnus what, yeah. right now. Uh, yeah. Well, we I think you, you look at what Jed Fish inherited at, at, in, the, in the football program. I actually think what Idea Barnes inherited was as bad, if not worse, because the, the, the women's basketball team in Arizona has been bad for a long time. You bet. A long time, not since I went to school there, were they were they a good program? And that was, trust me, that was a long time ago. So what she's done, and you know, in terms of recruiting, put her her program, this program, on the same level as as UConn, as other programs. I mean, like the in terms of the recruiting classes, they're that far up there. It's amazing. So you know, it's yet to be seen whether they can consistently be a national championship contender. But if Adia keeps recruiting like this, there's no reason they can't be. Uh, all right, let's do a little bonus question. Uh, Jamari Phillips uh, committed to Arizona on Sunday night. He is a 6'3 shooting guard, high four-star player, according to 24-7 Sports, 
We'll eventually talk to Matt Moreno. Hopefully in the coming weeks, he'll tell us more about this. Just buy or sell in general, Shane, now that the uh, weight is off with the uh, IARP, you got to buy or sell Tommy Lloyd's recruiting prowess uh, of, of high school players going forward. I'll buy it, although I don't think he's going to deviate too much from what he's already done because I think he likes finding those international guys because um, he's got, you know, he's so entrenched in, in that situation, especially over in, in Eastern Europe and getting those guys. So it, it's, a, it's a model that's worked well for him. So I don't think it's going to change that much. Uh, I think that maybe there will be a little more of an emphasis on the high schools, but I, I think especially with the transfer portal now, you can have that combination. you got to bring in young talent, you know, guys who not only – uh, will be outstanding freshmen, but hopefully we'll be there for maybe two or three years, even though you can't really control that. A combination of that, the international guys and the transfer. So I, I don't think his recruiting classes are going to look a lot different from what they've been. And uh, frankly, I'm not interested necessarily in having a top 10 or a top five recruiting class every year, as long as he's bringing in guys who are talented and have some experience and can be leaders, you know, like the Jay Wright model or even the Lute Olson model back in the day where you, you you don't necessarily win with a bunch of freshmen every year. So you have to have those guys, but I don't think Tommy Lloyd's recruiting classes are going to look much different in the future. Why would anyone not want to come play for Arizona and Tommy Lloyd watching his style of play, watching the teams that he it's beats, fun. watching yeah. his enthusiasm. Tell me how Arizona is not getting a top 10 class every year. If Tommy Lloyd wants one. Well, and by I, the way, yeah. Tell me, tell me how that Tommy Lloyd does not exploit the transfer portal every season. And I mean, he's brought in yeah. some, some interesting guys with, you know, Ballo and Kyer, and then this year, Cedric Henderson, Courtney Ramey. If you're transferring this offseason, why are you not considering Arizona? But I, I think Tommy Lloyd goes with the, you know, it's, you could say it's kind of cheesy, but the Herb Brooks model of not necessarily looking for the best players, but the right players. You want the guys who are going to fit your system. And so obviously you need talented guys, but you want people who are going to fit in to what you want to do, be coachable. And I, I think that's specifically why he went after Henderson and Ramey. I'm guessing there are some other guys that maybe were considered considered better, quote unquote, yeah. who he maybe had a shot at, but he wanted yeah. those guys. And it's obviously worked out well. Coming up next, let's talk to Aaron Torres, and he will give us his thoughts on the IARP ruling or whatever that was. And we're going to give away a couple of ice shakers here on Wildcat Country. Scooby, we sent you an ice shaker. Um, they are a sponsor, uh, courtesy of our buddy Chris Gronkowski. Uh, you have it Bro, right there. I love my ice shaker. Fun fact, when I was, I trained with Glenn Gronkowski, everybody, when we were trained together, people thought I was, I was the other Gronk brother. So it was kind of funny. But yes, I love my ice shaker. It is very good. I use it every day. I am a, I am a veteran to the ice shaker game, by the way. What's up, Wildcat Country? Chris Gronkowski here. Use coupon code Wildcat Country at iShaker.com. Finally, have one of the most energetic guests that we consistently have had on this program to talk. He's a college football or college basketball guru, and he knows a lot of college football too. He is Aaron Torres of Fox Sports Radio and Aaron Torres Online, and you'll give us the info coming up. But the reason that we're having him on, especially now, I mean, always, it's great to talk to him, but he needs his victory lap after Arizona got basically a slap on the wrist at most uh, from the IARP after like 10 years. What was it? Five years, something like that. So Aaron, I'm just going to let, I'm going to start it off. First of all, great to have you back. Uh, just go ahead and give us your victory lap and victory speech. Uh, basically that the NCAA was garbage. Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, you know, you did mention college football. I did notice that on just a random Sunday, Arizona got a former five-star flipped a kid from Bama, former kid from Georgia, no big deal. So you know, I don't know, you know, Tommy Lloyd's going to be playing second fiddle here soon to football, but um, no, listen, you know, I mean, listen, guys, the two of you, you've given me a, a forum and a space to talk about this so much over the last couple of years. Uh, I, I've never said that that Arizona never did anything wrong, which was obviously proven. But what I said was that the, you know, so much of the perception of Arizona was based on that report that came out from ESPN that was later proven in a court of law to be false. Um, and so we can get into it. I can take my victory lap, but most importantly, I'm happy for Arizona fans that have been dragged through the mud, the program that has been dragged through the mud, DeAndre Ayton, uh, to a degree, Sean Miller. And I'm happy to be perfectly honest. I'm happy that Arizona came out on the other side 
in great shape with Tommy Lloyd. They got the right guy and they can go forward moving forward without this hanging over the program, without this hanging over another incredible season. Uh, but it was surreal to, to, to watch the perception of what we thought Arizona was versus what the IARP and the NCA said they were uh, when the uh, uh, you know decision came out the other day. Yeah, Aaron, like my co-host has said many times is that, uh, and I believe it, that the the media damage that was done to the program outweighed, well, actually ha- the actual off-court uh, damage and everything with Book, Book Richardson, et cetera. Uh, do you see it that way as well? I don't think there's any doubt. Um, and I think, you know, and that has been the disappointing thing. <laughs> that was actually a question that a lot of Arizona fans asked me when it was all said and done is why did so many people get this story wrong? Uh, Why did so many people not do the homework to dig up the facts? And I understand, listen, a major media outlet puts out that first story and you know, that, that guy's colleagues probably have to defend him or stay quiet or not, whatever. But I, I have been amazed by the number of people that have just put this blanket over Arizona basketball of being a certain thing in a certain way and a certain this and a certain that. And it was obviously proven to be, to be largely not true. And so I I do think, you know, you know, I I think we could say now maybe the public, maybe the, maybe damage isn't the right word to what the media did because, you know, you got a top five team top, whatever it is, six in the country right now as we record number five. Um, Yeah. Yeah, team that's good enough to win the national championship, I believe, which we could talk about if you guys want to. But the point being is that, you know, I I think in the moment it was this weird thing. And I do think, I'll be honest, I think it hung over the program a lot when Sean Miller was still the head coach. Maybe the fresh start with Tommy Lloyd took some of that away. And maybe the perception of Tommy Lloyd is just so different than before. So I think it did damage in the moment. I think it did damage while Sean Miller was there. But I think... The last year or so, I think everybody's just turning on Arizona basketball to watch a really awesome quality of play in basketball. And so thankfully, like I said a minute ago, the program, it does feel like not only uh, on the court has moved on, but it does feel like to me, and maybe you guys disagree, but from a perception standpoint, um, I think people are just back to, oh, Arizona is an awesome basketball program without all the other stuff that came with it for so long. Uh, for those who don't know, know Aaron, you're one of the few people in the media that Sean Miller seems to like. Uh, sure. And you, you had uh, he was on on your podcast uh, last year um, before he took the Xavier job, just talking about basketball in general. Uh, the only thing that really surprised me about the IARP decision, because we saw them be kind of lenient with other schools as well, is that Sean Miller didn't get any sort of punishment, like no suspension at all. Even though you could say, okay, he was innocent, he didn't know anything about what was going on. He's still the head coach. He could still be held accountable. I thought that he was like Bill Self. He might have gotten at least a couple of games suspension. What are your thoughts on that? Well, two differing things. One, um, I know one guy that was a little surprised was Sean Miller because last year, now this was a year ago, he said on my show, he said, you know, and, and he had to be careful about what he said. And I get it. It was an ongoing investigation. But he said, listen, you know, I've been told that you know, I, the, the punishment to me will be limited. And I think he said at the time, I feel confident in the punishment that it will be levied to Arizona as well. But he did say, you know, do, is there a scenario where I could get a, a four, six, eight game suspension? Yeah, he did say that where I thought he might be okay. I, where I thought Arizona might be okay. And I said this the day when we kind of found out an hour or two before the ruling was coming down was how the IARP handled other programs. And, and I know this is random and an Arizona fan might not even be aware of this, but the Memphis one was really the eye opener to me because for people who don't remember the facts of the case. And I, I say with all these, uh, you know, uh, FBI cases, nobody remembers the facts except for the individual fan bases, but you know, they, they, you know, James Wiseman was recruited by Penny Hardaway. Uh, Penny Hardaway induced James Wiseman, if you will, to come play for his high school team, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the NCAA ruled him ineligible, and Penny Hardaway still played James Wiseman at Memphis while he was ineligible for, you know, by NCAA rule. And so I bring it up because Penny Hardaway got 
nothing, no suspension, no nothing, no this, no that. And keep in mind, Memphis never self-imposed an NCAA tournament ban like Arizona did. And Memphis clearly never fired Penny Hardaway the way that Arizona did. So from the Arizona perspective, I was not surprised there was no postseason ban, whatever. But then as I saw the way that the Penny Hardaway situation specifically was handled, I thought maybe it was possible that Sean Miller would face no major recourse, which is exactly what happened. And it appears as though whether it's fair or not, whether you believe that any of these head coaches, whether it was Rick Pitino at Louisville, whether it was Penny Hardaway at Memphis, or whether it was Sean Miller at Arizona, whether you actually believe that they knew nothing or not is a different conversation from how the IARP has treated them as a group. And as a group, the IARP has basically said, you know what, we don't believe, you know, if we don't have the facts to back up that you knew X, Y, and Z, we're not going to hold you accountable for it. Aaron, do you think that the Wildcats self uh, or the postseason ban that they self-imposed was all in, was basically in vain and they, they basically did not need to do that after it was all said and done? You know, just based on the Memphis verdict, I, I think it's hard not to feel that way. Um, and and so, you know, and that's the you know, and that, that was one thing, again, Coach Miller said on, on my show was, you know, there was this perception when he left of, oh, it's been X number of years since Arizona made a tournament. And I think you guys know and I think your audience knows, but but Arizona had a good team that year. You know, obviously, a lot of the guys that were on last year's roster that was a number one seed plus James Akin, Jonah, obviously there were a couple pieces that weren't there. But I know that that they had a really good team. I know they liked that team. Um, and so I guess you could say in hindsight, it's 2020. Um, but I, I, I think the inverse would be if you didn't self-impose in a year where, let's be honest, that's probably not the year that you make the Final Four run. It's probably not the year that you win the national championship. And then if somehow you do end up getting a postseason ban, which I don't necessarily think would have happened, but you sit back and say, why didn't we just do it when Sean Miller was here? Why didn't we do it in one of those years where, you know, we, we weren't going to like you hate to say it, right? Because a self-imposed ban is right. supposed to be a punishment as much as it is a deterrent. So, like, you're not supposed to just do it when you're bad, just in case as a safety net. But I, I think had had Arizona not done it and then there had been some sort of postseason ban or more stricter punishment, whatever, I, I could see the scenario where Arizona fans are really frustrated. So I don't think in hindsight it was the worst move. Uh, I think it, more than anything, it just showed con contrition to the NCA and to the IARP. And I do believe, you know, at least in my opinion, and maybe you guys disagree, that it probably did help out in the long run. Yeah, I think it absolutely did. And, and they had mentioned that in the report that they had already said the Wildcats self-imposed, et cetera. Now, I love to play the hypothetical game, so I'm going to ask another one. That's it. Sean Miller was still coaching Arizona. How much worse are the penalties, in your opinion? It's a great question. You know, again, part of me says, part of me says um, Penny Hardaway doesn't get any suspension or anything. So part of me says maybe it's the same. But then on the flip side, again, with, with Book Richardson obviously getting the 10 year show cause, Mark Phelps getting the two year show cause, it would feel a little weird to to really punish. Obviously, Book, it goes without saying, but Mark Phelps, you know, for the for the next two years on top of what he's already, quote unquote, served, if you will. Um, it, it does feel weird that, you know, you're talking about multiple year suspensions for multiple assistant coaches, but Sean Miller would have, uh, would have skated free. And so, you know, listen, everything is hindsight and everything is hypothetical, as you said, Eric. Um, but I also, I, I also think, you know, what, what stands out to me is part of the reason that you do make the move is to kind of throw yourself at the mercy of the NCA or the IARP, if you will. You know, Shane mentioned a bill self suspension that was self-imposed basically to say like, and by the way, of course, conveniently after they win the national championship and have raised the banner and there's no coming back, but that was kind of a, a, a self-imposed, if you will. Hey, look, you know, we might've screwed up. We're really sorry here. We're going to let our coach sit out these games against, uh, you know, Eastern Illinois and Tennessee tech. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if it would have been different on the one hand. I find it hard to believe that based on the punishments of Mark Phelps and Book Richardson, it wouldn't have. But again, with that Memphis precedent, and I know it's it's I know an Arizona fan doesn't care, but that really said a lot to me about how the IARP, uh, which will soon be extinct, by the way. So rest in peace, IARP, which is on its way to uh, to a, a brief existence. But that's the way that they are viewing these cases clearly. And we want to thank the IRP for their service, even though yes. it, took, it took took many years. That I, I I guess it was it was all well, worth it. Shane, Shane, if I can jump in really quick, yeah. the one thing I will say, I've heard from fans for years, for years, 
don't punish the current players. Don't punish the coaches that weren't there. So, yeah. you know, if, if you're not an Arizona fan, if you're not a Memphis fan, if you're not a Louisville fan, whatever happens with Kansas going forward, of course, you're going to be mad. Oh, Kansas, how did they get away with this or, or Memphis get away with that or whatever? This is what fans have wanted. So if this is what you've been telling me, it's kind of like the, the transfer portal, right? The tra Oh, players should be allowed to move whenever they want. They shouldn't be held. Well, then you lose your starting linebacker to the portal, and all of a sudden everyone hates the transfer rule. And it, it's kind of the same with this stuff. The IARP has basically done what fans have asked for as long as I've been following college sports, which is don't punish the current players, don't punish people that weren't involved. And that's what appears to have been the kind of, you know, the guiding light, if you will, of the IARP. All right, well, let's uh, shift to some on on court stuff before uh, we have to let you go, yes. Aaron. Uh, talking about this year's team, I like a lot of people are surprised that they seem to be just as good uh, as last year's team. Even though they lost three for uh, three draft picks, two first round picks, uh, and Justin Kyer off the bench as well. They've reloaded, and 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 a lot of guys have taken a step forward. What are your overall thoughts on this team, especially the the win over Tennessee on Saturday? Just in general, I mean, I, I am so impressed with, with Tommy Lloyd and his staff um, because, you know, and it, it was funny. I was thinking back to uh, an interview that Tommy Lloyd did in the preseason. With, I believe it was with The Athletic where they, they kind of asked him, they said, OK, you lose X, Y, Z, Ben Matherin, Dale and Terry, whatever. What is the biggest question going into the year? And Tommy Lloyd said me. Tommy Lloyd, you know, going into the season said, you know, I, I, I walked into a very nice situation. Now I got to prove that I can maintain it. And I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but the fact that, you know, this to me, and I've said it, and, and maybe this, this point doesn't carry as much weight because of what Gonzaga did over the weekend, in Alabama, this program to me looks more like Gonzaga than actual Gonzaga does where four or five years ago with Gonzaga, every off season guys in the program got better guys stay, they improve, they work on their skill set. And that's what you're seeing where, where you, I think you can make the case. Umar Balo is the most improved player in all of college basketball. Sure. Um, you know, Tabellus is right there. And I know he had good statistics, but, he, but, you know, he struggled down the stretch last year. Yeah. Kirk Reese is impressive. Uh, you know, Adama ball is impressive, all that. And then how the, the, the young, uh, the, the new players, I should say really fit in. I'll tell you this, Shane. I, I, I mean, I was a little bit higher on this team than most. And when I say higher, I, I mean, like, you know, kind of in that 15 to 20, probably not a final four, but, you know, maybe a second weekend team again, like last year, I, I watch it. You know, we all watch everybody. We all are fans of this sport. I, I, I find it hard to see a team that I don't think tennis or uh, Tennessee, I don't think Arizona can compete with on a neutral court. And let me say this really quick, fellas. I want to say this. So for people who don't know, I went to UConn. I'm actually wearing my UConn shirt right now mm -hmm. because uh, UConn played a bowl game earlier today. We lost the Myrtle Beach Bowl, neither here nor there. I thought of you guys, though, because I remember last year during the height of how awesome Arizona was. You guys asked me, you said, is it final four or bust? Like, should Arizona fans be disappointed if this season does not end in a final four after a few down years? That is what the UConn fan base is going, going through right now of you want to enjoy the moment, but you also are like, we're really, really, really good. And so I thought of you guys, cause you guys asked me that at this time last year about Arizona and the fan base that I most closely follow uh, feels the same way about their team this year of trying to find that balance between let's just enjoy this season, but there could be some big things on the horizon. All right, so I all right, so is it, is it final four bust for your UConn team right now? I, I don't view it that way. And maybe I'm removed. I don't live in Connecticut. I'm in the media. So I'm not living and dying by every possession. I'm still in the let's just enjoy it. And the other thing, too, Dan Hurley is not Tommy Lloyd last year, who was in his first year. Dan Hurley, believe it or not, still hasn't won a tournament game at UConn. This is year five, have made the first two and has made the tournament the last two years, have yet to win a game. So to to be disappointed if he doesn't go on, you know, win his first four NCAA tournament games at UConn in one year, uh, I don't think I can say that. So I don't feel that way. I'm sure there's part of the fan base that's starting to ramp up as people realize this is a really, really good team. I don't believe it should be Final Four or bust. I don't think fans should live that way, right? That's being an Alabama football fan where you don't enjoy victories. You just kind of move on to the next one. 
And so I don't feel that way, but I don't know if other fan, UConn fans do. And I don't know how you guys feel about Arizona now well, in year two with the Tommy Lloyd era. Well, it's, I think a lot of national college football or college basketball fans would be surprised to learn Arizona hasn't been to the final four in 21 years. Mm-hmm. They've been to eight, five elite eights in that time, including yep. uh, your, the heartbreaking loss to your, to your Huskies in 2011, but haven't mm-hmm. gotten over the hump. So th- there is some truth to that. I think it's like, well, I, I enjoy the wins over Tennessee and Indiana and some of the others. It's, you know, we, 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 we want to get back to the final four. So I, I think we're in the same boat there. The one, if I have half a second, the one thing I yep. will say the two programs have in common, West regional through Vegas, Arizona stomping grounds, East regional through Madison square garden, a Yukon stomping ground. So Arizona fans got mad when I, I referenced this on social media the other night, they're in the bill Belichick. We're on to the next game mode, but I think that stuff is starting to get important this time of year. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. My last question for you, Aaron, is I, I want to talk about the, the riddle wrapped inside an enigma wrapped inside a puzzle, whatever that is Kirk Creesa, who I is, we love Kirk Creesa and we also hate Kirk Creesa at times uh, with, you know, some of the things he did now the, the technical he got that almost cost Arizona the game against Tennessee, but he also does a lot of great stuff on the court, especially when he's passing the ball. What are your thoughts on him? Is he more asset to the team liability or somewhere in between? Well, I think he's an asset. I, you know, I'd be curious if you guys feel differently. Now he does wear his emotion on the sleeve. He does do dumb stuff. Uh, and he's had some, some not good games and, and, you know, maybe where he even shoots too much, but I forget who I heard say this, but, but they basically said, you know, the thing about Kerr is that he could miss 10 shots in a row and he's not afraid to take the 11th. And I think that's the mindset that you have to have as you are, uh, you know, one of the two or three faces of a team that's probably going to be realistically a one or a two seed favored. Uh, and two is you just get deeper into the tournament. And so, I, I mean, as an outsider, one, I absolutely love just following him and who he is and what he's about. But I would say it's mostly a net positive. And then I think it's finding that balance of hopefully trying to rein him in. That's obviously the coaching staff's job and all that stuff. But I, I would say it's mostly a net pod. Do you guys disagree? I know we might be a little bit. I, I, I don't, but I think like, and we had Casey Jacobson on last week and, you know, he talked about how sometimes he would just be stubborn about trying to shoot himself out of a, out of a slump Fair. when he's got other guys who could who can shoot the ball too. He's got guys he can pass the ball inside too. So he doesn't have to be that guy, but yet I feel like that's just who he is and he's not going to change. That's fair. That's fair. I say stop shooting when you know you don't have it. Kerr, don't don't take 10 shots. Take your five and let the other guy shoot. All right. I'm going to ask you something, Aaron. Having you on, we're going to talk something that's not U of A uh, basketball related. I want to ask you about the transfer portal in college football. Sure. I hate, and and Shane and I are going to talk about this coming up, so I'm kind of spoiling our next segment, that players can transfer in conference with no penalty. How do you feel about that? Arizona has just the context. Arizona's lost three players to USC in mm-hmm. the last week. I hate it. I get why they're going, but should something be done about this? Well, you know, I mean, the problem is, and, and this is, you know, I, and this is something as somebody like you guys who love college sports, I think there's been too many outside voices that don't understand the consequences when you say, players should be allowed on, you know, and it was funny because I kind of got into it with one of the other Fox sports radio hosts the other day of, you know, now he's on the fence of you got to stay. And if you lose your job, earn your spot back. And I'm like, three years ago, you were saying everybody needs to be able to leave whenever they want. So, so like, which is it? Um, Listen, I'll be honest. I've said this forever. One, the transfer portal, it's fun to follow and it gives us something to talk about. I don't think it's for the best of the sport. And and what I think we're going to increasingly see as NIL just becomes above board payment. And I said this uh, ironically, and I don't know if this, you know, Arizona fans will care about this one, but you know, when Tyrese Hunter was the big 12 freshman of the year last year in basketball um, has the ball in his hands, everything runs through him and he decides to leave Iowa state. I said, like, like we're headed towards a world where there's probably where every other program in college sports is like a feeder to, you know, eight to 10 programs in football and basketball. I think football and basketball, it's not just basketball or not just football. Um, So I'm with you, Eric. I don't like it. Um, I would like a couple things. One, I would like the one-time transfer to be a one-time transfer. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, everybody calls it college sports free agency. And I always say it's not free agency because in the NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, every guy is not a free agent every single year. Free, there's contracts and, you know, mm-hmm. LeBron James just can't decide I'm leaving the, like, so it, I, that's where I think it gets 
to be too much. When you have guys that, that two, three, four times, and, and it is now two, three, four times. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like that. I don't love the idea, like you said, of transferring inner, you know, kind of in the conference. I'll tell you a really interesting story. And again, I'll use a basketball reference, but you know, Kevin McCuller plays for Kansas right now in basketball and he came from Texas tech. And it was interesting because I remember when he announced he was transferring to Kansas, just on a whim, I I, I looked at the post and I looked at the mentions on social media and, you know, one or two people kind of said, you know, we wish you the best of luck, blah, 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 blah. And other people said, why, why are we wishing him luck? He's coming to our place to beat us next year. And so I, I think there's this narrative that you always have to be happy and always be supportive of every kid that makes every decision. One, under the current rules, they're allowed to make whatever decision that they want. But one, I think we all know they're not always making the decision for the right decision for the right reasons. Um, and two, if you're a fan and if we're giving these guys all the freedoms that we're giving them, which is OK, that's that's the way the rules are. But they're not immune from criticism either. So if a Dorian Singer and I guess they're playing at USC next year, but mm-hmm. if he came to Tucson next year and Arizona fans boot him when he caught a pass. I'm not going to have a fundamental issue with it because you bailed on the 85 guys in that locker room right there. So that's where I stand. I'm kind of in the middle where these are the rules, but I also don't blame fans for being fans. And I do think there's some times where people in the media, Oh my, you can't boo a college athlete. Well, now they're getting paid. They, they committed to the team and they left. If you as a fan want to boo, now don't be crazy. Don't be, you right. know, try, yeah. you know, you know, don't no death threats, nothing crazy like that. But if you want to boo when a guy walks into your stadium or arena, I have no problem with that. And, you know, Arizona benefited from a women's basketball perspective. They got when a, they got ASU's best player who's playing oh. for them, Jay LaVille. Yeah. I, and I told Shane at the time, pick up, hate it. Sure. So, yeah. I, it, and I feel the same way about these USC guys, which Shane and I are going to talk about. All right. Last question for you. Thank you, as always, for joining us. No, thank you. You have so many things going on right now. Where can people find you? Tell us about your betting partnership as well. Yeah, you know, if if you are on Twitter and I, you know, I think we all are on social media for our jobs, but I have to remember that not everybody is, but it's at Aaron underscore Torres. Um, And then, you know, really it's not as much as you think. I just share my podcast as an audio and then I share my podcast on video. So if you can spell my name, it's the Aaron Torres podcast. And then the same podcast goes up on YouTube. Um, and no, I mean, you know, I, as far as the betting partnerships concerned, you know, I've been linked up with a really cool company called Betfred Sportsbook. They're the biggest sports book in the UK. They have come to the United States. My understanding is they actually have a pretty nice presence in the state of Arizona. Uh, I'm going to try to get out there before the end of the basketball season. I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, but yeah, they're, they're great. You know, they're part, uh, uh, the gambling partner of the Cincinnati Bengals. So obviously this has been a great year for the Bengals, uh, but Bedford sports book, you know, I, I have all sorts of promos and giveaways that people, if they listen to my podcast can check out. Uh, but Aaron underscore Torres on Twitter and then the Aaron Torres podcast, which is available on both, uh, on, on obviously audio, but then on YouTube as well. And at Torres on Arizona yes. as well on Twitter. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. So that is run, you know, people ask me, I have, you know, 10 different accounts with my name on it, uh, different schools, school specific accounts. We have interns running it. It is not me tweeting because I I'll be honest, I couldn't keep up with all the Arizona commitments on Sunday, every 30 seconds. I, yeah, I left to go to the bathroom and football picked up two guys and then basketball picked up somebody. And I'm sure, you know, women's tennis got somebody that I missed somewhere along the way, but we have a great intern running it on campus. Um, you know, at all the games, I think, uh, you know, the interns home for Christmas over the holiday break right now, but the pulse of the Arizona fan, all Arizona all the time. So if you are on Twitter, but I annoy you by talking about other stuff besides Arizona sports, I do encourage you to Torres on Arizona. Uh, that is again, run by Arizona fans. And I just think it's a great resource to get every piece of Arizona information that you might miss throughout the day. Great to catch up with you. Great insight. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk to you before the end of basketball season. I hope so. And by the way, I'm going to be in the, at the Final Four. I hope my Huskies are there, but I hope the Wildcats are there. It's time, and this team is fun to watch. Uh, and, I, and I hope to see you guys there. That's really it. 
If you're looking to add value to your sports cards, you've got to check out DTSportsCards.com. They're an authorized dealer for PSA, which means you'll get great prices on your submissions if you go through them. And for just $2 a card, DT Sports Cards will take a close look at each card you submit and let you know whether it's worth grading. I just submitted some high-end hockey cards. They took a very close look, said they're good to go, and they all earned a PSA 10 grade, which tripled the value of each card. DT Sports Cards is located right here in Arizona. They provide quick, personalized service through email or direct messages. Find them online at dtsportscards.com and check them out on Instagram at dt underscore sports cards. Great to talk with our friend Aaron Torres. And I, I want to, I promised giving away uh, the ice shakers first. So, first of all, this segment is presented by our friends at DT Sports Cards. A lot of great stuff coming up in January, and we will tell you about that uh, going forward. But, Shane, this is what all everybody has been waiting for. We had a tremendous amount of signups, really, really impressed uh, of the favorite games. And I tweeted out, just in, I went through and read just about everybody's uh, submission. And a lot of the ASU game, which I, I would not have said just because it made me too nervous, but yeah. I hope Jed Fish saw that thread uh, and and saw what it meant to beat ASU. Oh, yeah. No, I think he already knows, but certainly that reinforces it. I I, I didn't count them, but I think a, a majority of people said the ASU game. I would have, too, if I would have entered. So I get there was a lot of a lot to celebrate, and there's some recency bias, but I, I think just for the, the future of the program, not to mention just us feeling good going into the new year, I think that win was was massive. Okay, now you want to give us a couple winners before we start talking football recruiting? Yeah, yeah. So we, I did a random drawing. I'm going to post the video uh, soon on the Wildcat Country page, but I, we want, frankly, we want people to listen to the podcast first. You got to listen to the podcast to find out who wins. Uh, but I did a random drawing. I, I recorded it. So it's all in the up and up. And I included everyone. We got 80 people, by the way, who introduced Fantastic. drawing. So thank you yep. so much for that. Uh, I don't even and, know who won, so I'm going to find well, out and, when you do. And and Chris Gronkowski, I'm sure, will be thrilled. I mean, I let him know. Yeah, I'm sure he's thrilled. The uh, the founder of Ice Shaker. So uh, the random drawing. Our two winners of the Ice Shaker bottles are, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce his last name. Sean Rambaran, R A M B A R A N. Sean Rambaran or Rambaran. I'm going to stop now. But okay, Sean, you won. And Jonathan Chavez. Jonathan Chavez. Those are our two winners. So uh, we. Uh, if you can either email us, uh, what's the email address again, Eric? Uh, it is catcountryaz at gmail.com. Catcountryaz at gmail.com or send us a DM on Twitter at the catcountryaz Twitter page uh, with your shipping address and we'll make sure to get you some ice shakers out. Congratulations yes. and thanks again to everyone who participated. That is awesome. And we are going to give away, hopefully give away more of these as we go along, but congrats uh, to our two winners uh, this time. All right, Shane. I'm going to make an argument here. This is not by yourself. It's just, you know, whatever. I'm going to make an argument that Arizona, in the history of its football program, got the biggest transfer that it has ever gotten when the form, I believe, is you pronounce it Justin Flo from Oregon. Let me explain to you why I think this is the biggest transfer ever. All right. I did a, did a little homework. You know, I like to frequent some of the gambling sites. You, do you, have, are you are you the gambling type, Eric? I didn't know just, that. About I mean, I do work for a company that you know, Sportsline.com that I do write gambling clubs. All right, good plug. Thank you. Um, so I was looking at the number one overall pick odds uh, for uh, the NFL. Justin Flo was fifty to one on one site and two hundred mm -hmm. to one on another site. So you're talking like Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, Justin Flo. Okay. Arizona got a guy, Shane. That even if he was thirtieth on the list, and I screenshotted one of them. Like, this is not conceivable that a guy would be even betting odds for anybody is going to, as the number one pick on Arizona. This is an incredible get by Jed Fish. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And Arizona's had a great, uh, like I said, a great weekend in terms of uh, getting transfers and, and, uh, and commits. Uh, so I, w I might agree with you, Eric, if, that, if, if Flo played quarterback. Uh, he does not. And I think Arizona's had two other transfers to the quarterback position who are potentially bigger. One of them won a Super Bowl with the Philadelphia Eagles. And then the other one, uh, Jaden Delora, okay. Okay. Uh, who will, remains to be seen. Uh, obviously, okay. he had a very good, uh, a bit up and down, but overall very good uh, year, first year at Arizona. Uh, and definitely did a lot more good than bad there. And leading Arizona to wins over UCLA and ASU and, and some other very good teams. So. Uh, I just think that if it's not the quarterback position, it's tough to make that argument since the quarterback is. I bet, okay. I mean, but this, I, 
I would say arguably this transfer. Remember Louis Louis Holmes in 2006 was the the five star from Scottsdale Community College. Oh my God, Arizona got a five star. This, I mean, and I guess that kind of counts because it was a JUCO guy. Yeah. This defensively is by far the the biggest transfer Arizona's ever gotten. Potentially, yeah. We'll we'll see. Yeah, and well, I think what it signals, and not to mention that, but but getting a an, an offensive lineman to flip from Alabama to Arizona. I mean, it it's amazing because usually. It, Arizona's watching those guys go to the bigger program. You know, even a couple of years ago, we had, you know, the curse of wildcat country. We had Keon Gray's on about yeah. his commitment to Arizona. And then a couple of months later, he's off to Ohio state. Well, I don't know if it's going to continue this way, but the tide is definitely turning. We're seeing some, some guys choose Arizona and it, incredibly we're, I mean, you're going to get into this here. I'm going to segue into your next topic. We're seeing some Arizona guys moving on to bigger schools, which typically doesn't happen. Yeah, so I'm very excited about this and great transfers. They got a, We're going to talk about this hopefully with Moreno. We'll have him on here in the coming weeks because they got the Georgia defensive lineman getting a guy from Georgia. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. I don't care how bad he, they flipped a guy from Alabama. Um, they got a couple of receivers. I mean, this Jed's doing an incredible job. I, it, I mean, yeah, it's just it's it's fantastic. Gone are, gone are the days when when Arizona is people pick Arizona. It's because it was their biggest offer over a couple of Mac schools. You know, that's how it was under Kevin Sumlin. And, and frankly, toward the end of the Rich Rodriguez era as well. Now you're seeing guys pick Arizona over teams like, or programs like Auburn and Alabama and, and Michigan and, and yeah. Oregon. And it's, it doesn't happen all the time, but just the fact that they're getting a handful of these guys is massive. Absolutely massive. So, I mean, I'll be honest. I Right now it's basketball. See, like I'm not plugged into football recruiting. We'll know more about this in spring, but we'll have Moreno on and he'll, he'll kind of fill us in. All right. So as much as getting the guy from Oregon was fantastic, great. With that said, I hate, Shane, I hate the fact that players are allowed to transfer in conference. And I, I complained about this with Jade LaVille. We talked about it with Aaron, uh, and, and I made my feelings on there. We talked about it with Jade LaVille with women's basketball. You have three guys now that went to USC. You have Christian Roland Wallace, Keon Bars, and now, before we recorded this, Dorian Singer. Yeah. They, I am going to stand by this, and I know that a lot of you listening will disagree. What Aaron said is right. If if you if you transfer in conference, you should have to sit out a year. Uh, no, nah, I, I I think. Or no, Aaron didn't say. I somebody else. You said, said that, but no, yeah, yeah you're putting words in Aaron's mouth. Shame on yeah, you. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. I I disagree. Uh, but look, you got to yeah. take it the good with the bad, Eric. I mean, you we Justin Flo, he wouldn't be here. He would. He have to sit out a year. If by your rule, uh, and you mentioned Jade Laville uh, yeah. at ASU, and I'm sure yeah. that they're going to be more examples. So you got to take the good with the bad. I would like to see some limitations on transferring. Like you get one transfer where you you can you play right away. If you want to do more than that, you got to sit out a year. I think that to me is more than fair. Um, I have some more thoughts on it, but I won't go into it too much here. But so I, I the, at least the transfer, like the one time, I'm fine with it. wherever you want to go. I don't care. Maybe there's some unwritten rules you can't, you shouldn't go to your rival, but those seem to be out the window now too. But but Shane, if you were to implement this rule, guys would think more about where they're going. You know, if you can't transfer in conference right away, guys mm -hmm. would think more. High school recruiting would mean more. It it means nothing now. It yeah. means absolutely nothing. Yeah. No, I understand your point. I look. I'm in favor of placing some limitations on it, and I hope that's going to happen at some point. I just think the in-conference thing uh, to me that that's not as a big a deal to me. That's all. Okay. I, I hate it. Uh, good luck to those guys. Uh, listen, I, I by, the, by the way, mm -hmm. I understand Dorian Singer to USC. You think bars and Roland Wallace are going to be starters there or do they, just, do they get some NIL I, I guess. I just, I mean, you're, you're, you're not, you're not transferring <sighs> if you, I, it's very, very bizarre. To me. I I thought so too because I mean, Bars kind of struggled this past year. Maybe that was because of the coaching staff and the, the change there. I don't know. And Roland Wallace is very good, but to me, it's like okay, you want to show off your stuff for the NFL. You're only going to have more competition at USC. I mean, Singer is going to be great. He's he's going to be be a star there at USC. But the other two guys, interesting decision is all I'll say. Yeah, it was uh, very, very uh, bizarre, and uh, I don't get it. And uh, to each their own, Shane. Um, it's it's bizarre. All right. Uh, I don't think we need to pick games for uh, Morgan State and uh, Montana State. So we'll, we'll pass on that. Do have a couple of college football games I'd like to do. I, they may be after we record next week. I have a foursome. I went three and oh last week. You went on three. Uh, oh. Let's go through these real fast. I didn't realize uh, that until now. OK. Yeah. Oh, sorry about ahead. that. Yeah. Yep. 
Uh, so you're down seven. You're down six to me on the season. Right. Well, but you'll have plenty of opportunities. Yep. Yeah, you have plenty of okay. Uh, guaranteed rate bull. Wisconsin's a three point favorite over Oklahoma State. Who you got? Wisconsin at Oklahoma State. Uh, I go OK State. It probably means more to Wisconsin just the fact they got to a bowl game. Both teams underachieved this year, but I'm going to go. I'm going to take OK State. I'm going. Uh, Mike Gundy's great in bowl games, but I'm going Jim Leonard coaching for his alma mater in his last game before Luke Fickle takes over, taking Wisconsin. I think it's going to be an ugly game. I will be there. Uh, Holiday Bowl, Oregon minus 14 against North Carolina, who lost their last, I think, three uh, at the uh, at the end of the year. Uh, who you got? Hey, Oregon easy cover. I know they're disappointed to be there, but they're much better than North Carolina. Yeah, I'm not I'm not one who usually likes to play double digit spreads in bowl games, but I just think Oregon Bo Nix coming back next year. Yeah, I think he has something to prove. Uh, Cheese it bowl. I think it's just a fun matchup. So I thought I'd throw it in there. Uh, Florida State is minus eight against Oklahoma. Who you got? Isn't it sad that Cheese It Bowl is not here anymore? It's like you can't eat guaranteed rates. I know, right? I, I did. I, God bless the Cheese It Bowl. All right. I got off track. Tell me, tell me what the line is again. Uh, minus eight for Florida State. Minus eight for Florida State. Um, Florida State finished pretty strong. I'll, I'll go with I'll go with the Knowles to cover. I feel like or Oklahoma is going to show up in this bowl game. Like six and seven in their first year under Brent Venables if they lose. I have a feeling Florida State was good under Mike Norvell. I feel like Oklahoma, I don't know if they win the game, but I think the game's going to be interesting. Okay. Final pick here, uh, Texas is minus four against Washington. Bijan Robinson is not playing Tucson product. Bijan going to the NFL. Uh, I like Washington, Shane, to upset uh, uh, Texas outright. I know the game is being played in Texas, uh, but I think Washington uh, beats him with Michael Penix Jr. Sets up for a big next year. How about you? It's a great matchup. I mean, as far as a non New Year's six game, it's one of the best out there. Yeah, I'll go with Washington as well, especially with Robinson not playing. I'm, I'm going to go with the Huskies. All right, so we disagree on a couple of them. Let's see if you can uh, if you can get a little bit closer. Uh, we may those games may be after we record, so we'll find out. But uh, next week we'll pick all the big games, and we're going to do kind of a year in review show. Next week, our favorite moments uh, from the uh, from the whole year that we've been doing this. Shane and I have done a podcast every single week, and it has been an absolute blast. Thank you for listening. And I promise, well, I can't promise, but I'm very hopeful that we'll have more ice shakers to give away because you guys really showed up for that and uh, really, really impressive. So uh, for thanks to Aaron Torres for joining us. For Shane Dale, I'm Eric Cohen. As always, bear down and happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas to all of you out there.